so we, we've had some ch schedule changes, but uh, right now we have Damian Burks uh, to talk about some cloud security stuff. We're absolutely thrilled to have him. And I want you all to give him a round of applause, give him a warm DFW welcome. Here's Damian. So how's everybody doing today? So far so good? Yeah, good, good. All right, cool, cool. Well, um, I, let's just go ahead and get right into it. Uh, so what I'm gonna talk to you guys about today is called uh, minimizing AWS S3 attack vectors at scale. And I'm pretty sure you're probably gonna be wondering like what does it mean to, uh, to try to minimize those attack vectors at scale, considering that most organizations have multiple AWS accounts. So before I get into it, just a little bit about me. So um, short by you somewhat. So I'm currently a cloud security engineer at Citibank. Uh, and I'm also pursuing a master's degree in cybersecurity and I'm almost done. So yay, next year, finally, right? Life happens. Um, I'm AWS certified four times, so I have a range of AWS certifications. Uh, and I'm also open source contributor for um, this tool that I developed called DataCop. And also, um, if you're familiar with Open Policy Agent or OPA, I also write a little bit of code for them from time to time as well. Uh, DevSecOps advocate and mentor, I men have a couple of mentees, and I'm also a father of two kittens, not children, <laughs> um, as you can see in the picture right there. So uh, those are my babies. And uh, some activities or hobbies for fun that I like to do, I like to play video games. If there's any gamers in the room, just come follow, chat with me afterwards. Uh, anime and cars. Um, I know Garrison right here, you got the infinity, so we gotta talk. But uh, aside from that, this is a little bit about who I am and let's just go ahead and get right into it. So the first thing is S3 attack vectors explained. So we know for a fact that um, buckets have been exposed quite frequently within the past couple of years, right? Since people have started moving and migrating all their data to the cloud, primarily to S3 buckets. Um, some of those common attack vectors that you that we've seen, for example, have been data exfiltration. So if you take a look at the right side of the screen, um, that's a very small snapshot of some um, database credentials that were exposed from Netflix's S3 bucket that was publicly exposed to the internet, which is bizarre, but okay. And then you also have some ransomware and malware that people try to deploy because, and what I'm talk, talk to you about this in a, in a little bit is, People usually read and write to S3 buckets from their EC2 instances and other services in AWS. So having that, with that being stated, like those malware and that ransomware will be loaded into that EC2 instance if they're not careful, right? Uh, so with data exfiltration, some common things that have been exposed is PII, or personally identifiable information. So you got credit card numbers, SSN numbers, uh, so on and so forth. Credentials and tokens, uh, again, database credentials and tokens, and so on and so forth. So many different things that have been exposed. Um, with ransomware and malware, depending on the intent of the malicious app or the file, the impacts may vary. Um, and you, there's not really, I haven't necessarily identified any research as far as like what examples I can give y'all, but I know for a fact that we, we all know, we're all security professionals, that the impact does vary. Uh, so how does that really happen? Right, when you have these S3 buckets that have been deployed um, and you have all these files that are located in those S3 buckets, um, how do or how is data exfiltration happening or how do these you know, ransomware and malware applications get inside of the S3 bucket? One of the common causes is the lack of access control, right? So people don't necessarily have uh, roles and whatnot attached to those S3 buckets to be able to prevent people from uploading those documents as well as blocking those, you know, public access. You have lack of monitoring, meaning that there is no, or usually I'm not going to say no, but most companies don't monitor what's going in or out of their S3 bucket. So when people upload something, it's like, okay, it's there, it's there. but we don't necessarily know what's there, right? So you just know that it just has these objects or these files, but you don't know what is inside of those files. You don't know the contents. You just don't know. And then the last thing, which kind of wraps everything up, is lack of access to control and lack of monitoring is all a part of misconfiguration, right? And the reason why is because, well, it's, it's not properly configured. So with that being stated, let's go ahead and get into the scenario. So I have this example organization I created, so hopefully no one has named their organization generics. But if you did, I do apologize because I'm, yeah. So. In this example, it's basically a mid-sized gaming, uh, mobile gaming company that caches their server and user data within several S3 buckets and on-prem. 
but the key thing about it is that the company operates out of a single account and they utilize like all these different AWS services such as like EC2 and Lambda and Kokomo. So they're pretty much all in the cloud, all in, right, for the most part. So within the past year, they sold over a thousand copies of their hit mobile game called Angry Dolphins. I don't know why dolphins will be angry, but they're angry. So after that debut of their mobile, their hit mobile game, the organization was hacked. How? Well, somehow the hackers gained access to, and I have this in red, the EC2 instance that was storing and retrieving personal identifiable information and PCI data from a single S3 bucket that was public. Now, why was the S3 bucket public? We don't know. But um, we had, or the security engineers had deployed this tool called Cloud One um, that basically observed or observed the malicious files within that S3 bucket. And it basically uh, highlighted that there was this malicious Excel workbook or worksheet um, that was loaded onto the web server and then it created a backdoor for those um, hackers to SSH into the instance. So a lot's going on there and I know that there's a lot of words so let's look at a picture. I think my favorite. So in this architecture diagram you see we have a bad actor and you see you have this report call, customer report, um, whatever bad dot XLS worksheet. And that bad actor somehow uses the AWS CLI to upload this document to this public S3 bucket that contains PCI and PII data, right? From that S3 bucket, you see there's this EC2 instance called the payments processor, and that payments processor has a role that's attached to it that is called the EC2 to S3 role. So in short, what that EC2 instance is doing is that it's assuming this role, and this role has permissions to be able to read and write to that S3 bucket. And that's basically how they're able to get all the information that's in that S3 bucket, right? So the first thing that we're gonna do is, once they've read and loaded everything onto this web server, that's how that attacker was able to compromise that system, based on it reading into, uh, reading those Excel workbooks and decompressing that information and so on and so forth, right? So how do we necessarily know, um, aside from a malicious file, how do we know what type of data we have in that bucket? as far as the PII and PCI. How do we classify that? Well, we're gonna move over to um, AWS Macy. So if you're not familiar with AWS Macy, it's basically this uh, data security and privacy service that is created by AWS that leverages machine learning and pattern recognition to be able to uh, discover the sensitive data that you have in AWS, particularly in S3 buckets. And with those, you uh, with those, it has a oh, with a Macy, it has a couple of capabilities. The first thing is um, it automatically provides a inventory list of all the S3 buckets that you have within that particular account. It goes in there and inspects all the data and all the files or objects, and it classifies them based on a specified criticality, right? Uh, whether it's high, medium, or low, which we'll talk about in a second. And then also, if you're you know an organization that has uh, you know data that's supposed to be compliant. It also helps those organizations meet data compliance regulations such as GDPR, HIPAA, and so on and so forth. So a couple of pros and cons of Macy is that, um, so it's fully managed data type. So the thing with that is if you take a look on the right, um, all of the rules and policies that they create is fully managed by them. So they have uh, policies and rules for social security numbers in the U.S. or uh, tax identification numbers. Um, and it doesn't just, uh, it's not restricted to just the United States, but it's also globally. So they have things for in China, so on and so forth. So it's fully managed by them. You don't have to worry about that. Uh, it seamlessly integrates with all the AWS services, such as EventBridge, CloudWatch, and stuff functions, which is super important. And, and I'm going to tell you all about that in just a second um, and why it's important. It you can customize the data types, meaning like if you have like custom, let's say custom customized data that's proprietary to the business and you want to create reg regular expression rules or patterns for that to be able to detect that, you can do that with Mason. You can add that information in there. And then it also create, you can create an automated dis uh, data discovery job um, that runs on a specific basis. So if you want to run it daily, weekly, monthly, you can do that. It's perfectly up to you. Um, but the cons, of course, is that when you get into <laughs> when you get into um, doing this with Macy, anything with machine learning or AI, you gonna know you gonna pay that money, right? So it's gonna be very expensive. Um, not only that, but when you get this information, 
when it is returned to you based on how many data or how much data you have or how many rows that it detects, it's going to give you this bloated JSON file. And it's not feasible for somebody to read through 50,000 lines of JSON just to figure out what uh, Macy has found, right? And even in the UI, it can look a little complex for whatever reason. And then the last part is there is no type of feature available for audio remediation of the bucket. So let's say if you do find something, and let's say that uh, the organization, you're, they have a compliance rule that you're not supposed to store social security numbers or any kind of PCI data in the cloud, but Macy finds that. It's just like, okay, hey, we found it, but we're not gonna do anything about it, that's on you. What type of shit, I mean, excuse my language, but what, well, why, would you, why would you even do that, you know? So there's no type of way for you to auto-remediate those buckets. So that's pretty much like the downside of Macy, and that's where DataCop comes into play. But before we even get into DataCop and what it does, let's get into this next thing that I mentioned earlier, which was Cloud One. So, uh, Trend Micro Cloud One's file storage uh, security. So it's this cool, 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 cool times twenty application that Trend Micro developed, um, and it's basically a security solution for S3 buckets and file systems in AWS. Um, so it basically provides malware and ransomware scanning on those files in those in multiple cloud environments, not just restricted to AWS, but it could be like GCP or Azure, so many other things. So it can detect like several different types of malware if you have them. So well, you don't want to have them, but if you do, they would detect viruses, trojans, spyware. The list goes on, but those are like the three main ones that I picked out. And then it also supports the scanning of different types of file types. So you got bin, exe, PDF, zip. XLS, you know, Excel, work, work, uh, workbooks, you got C, C, CSVs, so many different things that it does. So with that being said, how does it work? So let's just dive into this just a little bit. So let's say we have a file, right? And we upload that file to whatever the cloud storage containers is, whether it's S3, for example. Um, somehow, in some way, they have a magic wand that subscribes to this little bucket and it will scan, the scan is gonna be triggered for that particular file automatically. And what's gonna happen is that that file is then going to be sent to whatever repo repository that they have, all the data and the contents, and then they're gonna inspect it and do some magic on their end and determine whether or not it's malware, it's malicious or not. And if it is, it's gonna tell you what type of file or malicious file it is. Uh, so you have, that's pretty much how um, FSS works from a high level. And let's go ahead and just get some con pros and cons of what FSS, what it, what it is. So a couple of pros. Um, so if you have massive files, it supports scanning of massive files, five gigs or more, which is fantastic. Um, it's extremely fast. So if you upload a file, um, even if it's a massive file, it'll literally scan it in about three to five seconds. Um, and it will return our, uh, that report back to you very quickly. Um, it is concurrent, uh, is able to scan like multiple files. Um, so you don't necessarily, um, let's say if you have like 10 files and you upload them all at once, it's gonna scan all 10 of those files at once and report it all back to you. And then uh, it's easy to deploy and it's, and it's extensible, meaning that if you wanted to add some custom data or custom logic to it, you can. It's very easy to do so. It's an open source project, so they can just you can just go ahead and add that information in there. But with it also being open source, the problem is it's not free. So is it really open source? Not really. But there's a part of it that's open source, which is the logical part, but you have to pay for the service. So um, that's actually a, the downside to it. But you know, I got free AWS credit, so I'm not worried about that. Uh, <laughs> so that's that's the only thing that we can have. So let's just wrap this up. And let's move on to some more diagrams so I can show you, give you a scenario of uh, generics with Macy. So let's say, for instance, now we know the organization was compromised and the security engineers are like, okay, let first, before we even get to any type of remediation or mitigation, let's understand what type of data we have in our bucket. So in this case, they, uh, the security engineer logs into the AWS console and they navigate to the Macy dashboard and they trigger a job, right? And they trigger that job to scan all of the contents in uh, the PCI and PC, uh, in that S3 bucket that contains PCI and PII data. So if you take a look on the right, these are just some mock findings, but you can see that the security engineer found like 58,000 
uh, records of sensitive information. So you got like credit card numbers and social security numbers and so many different things. And what Macy automatically does is by default, they classify any type of sensitive data that you find or that it finds as high, right? So they realize that, hey, these are, you know, we have a whole bunch of records here. Nine times out of 10, somebody may have stolen something because of the bucket itself is publicly accessible, which is horrible. Um, so with that being stated, now we'll move on to cloud one, uh, file storage security. So it's a bit different in a way where uh, Trend Micro has their own dashboard. Uh, so instead, the security engineer is say if they do want to log into that information to see it, the type of malicious file that was um, you know, caught, what they'll do is that they'll log into this Trend Micro dashboard and you see that we have not just one account, but two accounts. We have this account with the question marks there, which means that this is Trend Micro's like home account where they basically, um, well, all the data that it scans or the S3 objects that are scanned, all that information is sent back to them. Their repository is deployed in this malicious account, and then there's just like interaction between this account and their account. So he's gonna log in, he's gonna look into that UI, the UI is gonna pull all the results from their malware repository where they store all of your information about your objects, and then you can see on the third thing, uh, Trend Micro is pointing to that S3 bucket, which means that they have something there that is subscribed to that S3 bucket. So it's event driven completely. So if something happens to that S3 bucket, it's just gonna trigger events and send that back upstream to Trend Micro and their malware repository. So we'll get into the mitigation strategy without automation. So let's say we gotta do all this manually, right? Uh, manual auto <laughs> mitigation for the win, not. Um, so I condensed the action steps for this because nine times out of 10, you're dealing with, at this point, two different attack vectors. You're dealing with one for data exfiltration, you're dealing with another one for this malware file that somehow miraculously is uploaded or appears in this S3 bucket. So the first thing we gotta do is, all else, disable the public access for that S3 bucket. Why do you have it publicly accessible in the first place? I don't know. We don't want that anyway, right? And then what happens after you disable that, you don't necessarily know at this point in time, since it was public access, what type of roles are associated with this bucket. So now that it's public accessible, now you have sometimes, your roles may have been compromised because now they have information on the roles. And nine times out of 10, I don't know about you guys and your organizations, but my organization typically or may, may not um, use roles, right? And use the same roles, share roles, okay? Um, but you have that information, they they can use those roles for pivoting into other things, right? And then you attach a bucket policy that denies all access to those resources and services. So uh, that bucket policy is basically going to deny all access for all roles and from any service. So no services will be able to access that S3 bucket, right? Um, you wanna inspect each object and file and identify what the issue could be. So now we gotta go through each file, and we gotta determine whether or not it has or contains PII and PCI data, and then move it to an on-prem server or a file system and delete it, right? And if not, if it doesn't contain the information, now we gotta move on to figuring out whether or not it's a malicious file. And if it's a malicious file, then we need to delete it and then figure out the impact. So you got all of these things, if it's this, then do this, if it's this, then do this, how long will it take? might take you a week, might take you a day. We don't know, right? Because we need to measure the impact. So that is where the problem is going to come from. And that's why we have automation. So now we'll get into DataCop, which is supposed to come and save the day. Not really. But um, so DataCop is the art. This is a framework that I, that I wrote. Um, it's open source, but it's basically an AWS framework that mitigates the potential of vulnerable S3 buckets. Um, and what that happens is that it leverages Macy results that you get to be able to automatically block those S3 buckets and contain that PII or any classified information. And it also uh, relies on now Cloud One results as well to be able to make that determination. So some features um, is that it automatically provisions infrastructure to bridge the gap between Macy and S3 with AWS CDK and Python. Um, there's also some configurable settings for bucket blocking, so you can do it yourself, or you can configure it the way you want to. 
and it's event driven, meaning that it ties into um, some of the AWS services. So you don't necessarily have to trigger it. It does it automatically. And it's easy to extend for other AWS security frameworks, such as Cloud One and so on and so forth. So some considerations with this is that um, there are quite a few IAM permissions and policies that you need to create in order to use the following services because DataCob relies on EventBridge, Lambda, uh, CloudWatch, SNS, Step Function, and S3. So a little bit about each of those services. EventBridge is basically, uh, it's configured rules for detecting events uh, to the Macy's result bucket. You got Lambda, which is a serverless component to execute code. Uh, CloudWatch is where all the logs will be. SNS is a simple notification service. So it's basically where um, it's sending those emails to the end users when something happens. You got Step Function, which is a, uh, it's like a visual workflow service um, that relies on a Lambda to execute any kind of blocking actions that we have um, in a specific order. And then I am, which we all know I am, I am identity access management. So roles, permissions, et cetera, et cetera. So the beautiful thing about DataCop is that it creates all the roles and permissions that it needs to operate and function properly. The only thing that it doesn't modify is SCPs, which stands for service control policies. And service control policies operate at the organizational level. So that pretty much is like you once you, once you modify the SCP, uh, policies and roles that's god level status it pretty much replicates and uh, on towards like any of the item roles and so on and so forth and the last thing is that um let's say if you wanted to quarantine any kind of files that you find uh they'll create an s3 bucket for quarantining uh those you know an s3 bucket for quarantining files so now we get into more architecture diagrams which um, in this case, we'll explain DataCop and Macy, and then we'll move on to DataCop and Macy architecture walkthrough and so on and so forth. So let's say the security engineer logs into the AWS management console and they execute this Macy job against this S3 bucket. The key question is that information is gonna send, be sent to the DataCop framework, but what does DataCop do exactly for that, right? So. What happens is that um, this data is going to go straight to DataCop, and if you take a look, you'll see that on the uh, um, on the second step, there is a results logs S3 bucket. So DataCop will subscribe to that bucket. So every time Macy publishes the results, it's going to pull those results from that bucket, and then it's going to go ahead and execute this step function. And this step function is going to contain this all of the steps that it needs to be able to perform blocking activity or actions on that S3 bucket, right? So, and that step function is gonna interact with that Lambda multiple times. And then once it's done blocking whatever it is or whatever S3 bucket, then it's gonna go ahead and send in a, an email to any type of subscribed uh, stakeholders that you have. So incident responders or security engineers, whoever subscribes to it is gonna get that email. Right, and then the logs, all the logs, regardless whether it's from step function or from the Lambda, is going to be logged in a CloudWatch log group, which is, again, automatically created by DataCop. Don't have to worry about that. So you hear this word blocking, you hear this word step functions. Um, what exactly happens? So this is a picture of the step function, of the state machine for Macy, and these are some of the steps. So there's a total of seven steps that we have, and the first step is going to be when it figures out or it gets that information from Macy, their logs, is gonna parse through that log, is gonna determine the severity of the log. So the severity also is determined by the user, but let's say for example, if the severity of the bucket or severity of the findings is high for the bucket, it's gonna determine whether or not we should block the bucket. And if we do, it's gonna check the bucket status to ensure that it hasn't already been blocked or that, that there is no kind of policy that's attached to it, right? such as like if a security engineer automatically goes in there and he adds a manual policy, then it won't block the bucket because it's going to consider it as blocked already. So if not, then it's going to go ahead and block that bucket. And what blocking is going to do is it's going to attach two things. It's going to attach a denial of policy and it's going to revoke the public access to that bucket. Now, that denial of policy is going to have an exception. And that exception is for a specific role 
that you share, for example, for a security engineer to be able to just go into that account. So nobody is going to have access to that account except for the security engineer or an authorized personnel. Right. And once it's done with all that, it's going to send a nice report and say, hey, this bucket's been blocked and continue on. Right. So once we finish with that, we get through. Let's go over the uh, cloud one uh, file system security and data cop together. Right. So in this particular case, we're using the example where the malicious threat actor or the bad actor uploads this file into the S3 bucket. The thing is, it's different because there is no manual interaction with Trend Micro because it's already subscribed to the bucket. So it's going to automatically trigger that information and it's going to send the, it's going to activate the scanning and it's going to send those results, um, whatever it finds, to the malware file repository in the other account. And then all that information, while it's doing that, once it comes back, it's going to go straight to Datacop. Now, the question is, in this case, what does Datacop do? Do you guys think it does the same thing or is it going to do something different? Let's find out, right? So in this case, I've expanded on the architecture for, the, um, for FSS a little bit. So we'll start from, we already know the bag adapter has uploaded that information to the S3 bucket. Now, the key thing is that with FSS, uh, the FSS, it is, there's a lambda and there's a role that's associated with it. So that file is gonna go straight to that lambda, it's gonna uh, start parsing through it, and it's going to interact with that malware repository, right, with that role, because that role is a cross-account role between that, that enables the lambda function to be able to communicate with the malware repository, right? So once it's done that, and it continues to um, parse through that file, it's gonna go straight to and interact with the data cop lambda if the file itself is malicious. And if so, then that's when it's gonna start and it's gonna execute this other step function for FSS. And then that step function is then gonna interact with the Lambda again to do to, you know, uh, do to all of the blocking capabilities and whatnot and so on and so forth. So, and then in the end, they still get a nice little email because they have the SNS topic and all of the logs again are gonna be uh, subscribe or sent to the cloud watch log group for this particular step function. So the state machine itself, again, there are seven state, uh, what did do? way more than seven. I'm sorry. It's a typo, but there are quite a few states in this one. And the reason why is because we are not only, um, blocking the S3 bucket, but we're also copying data or object from that S3 bucket and moving it into the quarantine S3 bucket and getting rid of the bad file that's in the uh, original S3 bucket. So the first step is we copy the object to uh, the quarantine bucket. So um, that's where we're going to basically find a malicious object from the original bucket, copy that to the quarantine bucket. Then we're going to remove that object that we just copied from the parent bucket. We're going to check the parent bucket status to see if it's been blocked and if it hasn't then we're going to go ahead and block it in this in a report so we're moving that information to a different bucket for analysis and then we're going to go ahead and block that parent bucket that we already have so what it looks like when it's fully automated is and this is a big one so the security engineer is going to execute that macy's job and they're going to upload those result logs to uh macy's going to upload the logs to a result bucket and then is going to trigger that information. Uh, I'm sorry. Once that uh, information is uploaded to the uh, the result bucket, then data cop is then going to be triggered and it's going to start to uh, see if that bucket has been blocked and start blocking the bucket based on the results from Macy itself. So if it has any PII or PCI data, it's going to block that bucket, right? Then from another side or another vector, we have Trend Micro. So if the attacker uploads that information, which most likely has already done so, what's gonna happen is Trend Micro is then gonna activate and it's gonna do its thing. It's going to inspect the files in there and if it is malicious, then it's gonna trigger Data Cop and Data Cop is then gonna go back over it and do a little bit of analysis. As you can see on right by step two, you'll see that we have that report is being moved from 
one bucket to the next bucket and that quarantine bucket you'll see that it's black and another one is blue i mean not blue but green and so on and so forth so at this point you're coming from two different angles you have uh some analysis from one part where we're checking to see if the file is malicious or is malware because if it is then it's going to block the bucket and if it contains any bad data or data that we're not supposed to have in the cloud it's going to block that bucket now there's not going to be any type of um how to say we're not going to copy the pci pii data we're just going to leave it there but if it's malicious we're going to copy that to a different bucket right so that's pretty much what's going to happen and as you can see there's like a pretty little email at the bottom it lets them know how many buckets have been blocked or what bucket has been blocked and it gives them some type of hash that is proprietary to the step function because the step function is going to have a history of all the actions that were taken on those buckets and so on and so forth so i say all that to say to conclude right when you in incorporate trend micro you incorporate macy and data cop all together you minimize at least two different attack vectors one you stop data for exfiltration from happening because you block the bucket and you stop it from being publicly exposed and you cut off all the access to the roles on top of that you're also stopping ransomware from being uploaded or malware from being uploaded and then traversed or moved into different types of EC2 instances or exposing of different services, right? There's also a quick response time to any kind of malicious files that you may have. So if you have malware Trojan, it's gonna to respond to that very quickly. It's completely scalable, meaning that you can deploy into multiple accounts. So we all know most organizations have not just one, but like thousands or hundreds. You can easily deploy this into multiple accounts and kind of have everything securing from just each account. And also from a manual standpoint, you save a ton of time on manual labor and analysis by eliminating the complexity of all of those repetitive and mundane tasks about uh, for blocking S3 buckets and analyzing files and performing forensics, so on and so forth. So you just kind of eliminate all of the manual stuff and only focusing on for example, uh, doing a reconnaissance on the bucket and then also analyzing any malicious files that you have. And with that being stated, um, thank y'all so much for listening to me speak and ramble. <laughs> and um, you scan a QR code, there's a link to the, um, the code um, in GitHub and a couple of other links as well. Um, and I'm now open for any questions if you have any. Oh, yeah, I, I got a couple. All right, so I think you raise your hand first, and then it's you guys. Yeah. Uh, how frequently do you give out false positives other than from the bucket? So the question was, how careful do you need to be about buckets, false positives causing buckets to be quarantined? Is that what's, that's the way you right. phrase it? Uh, okay, so here's the thing. Um, that's 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 actually a really good question because it is entirely dependent on uh, Macy. So the results that come directly from Macy, if someone uploads like let's say uh, an email address or uh, email content that has mock SSNs and it gets blocked, um, then there's not really much that we can do unless there is like. Um, uh, an example or like a regex that we put in there uh, to kind of, you know, templatize or m minus the uh, false positive that you have. Um, but it's still going to block the bucket if it detects a social security number. It's not smart enough to detect or de to discern rather um, if the email itself is um, malicious or not or contains. You see what I mean? So, yeah. No worries. Yeah. Um, yes, I did. And that is where um, I made an exception for the trend micros role um, into the deny all bucket policy. So you just simply just say like, okay, well, we know that this role needs access to this bucket in order to inspect it. So just give that bucket, um, get that role into like the whitelisted list of policies that can access this role. So yeah, I did run into it. And I was like, Oh, shit.
yeah, let me go ahead and leave you. Yeah, so. Uh, yeah, you got it. I think, oh. Whichever one. Yeah, okay. He's a, you're closest. Okay. Uh, <laughs> So S3 does not care what kind of file it is. It's just there for you to, it's, it's just storing files. They don't have a way to discern what type audit that that's like built into S3 yeah, like to discern it. Yeah, no, you have to like either get a third party service for it or you have to use Macy. But Macy is only limited to inspecting the file. It doesn't discern what type of file it is, whether it's malicious or not. So then you have to get another third party service to do it or you have to build something on your own to discern it. Yep. Shared responsibility model, not too shared. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Oh, yeah, yeah. It's not a two part question, but is Microsoft Reliant Power of Attorney not really classified as a phenomenon? Uh, yeah, it is, because I haven't necessarily found a way to develop, uh, or I would say, like, there is a open source website that you can use to, like, upload files to it. The problem is, is that um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Virus Total. Yeah, so like you can upload your file there and you know, it'll tell you whenever it can, you know, that hey, this file is maybe 80% malicious. Uh, I was gonna go that route, but then I found out that there is no type of waiter or limit. So I literally have to poll and check like every five minutes to see if they scanned it yet. Hey, did you scan it yet? Did you scan it yet? So yeah, no. It relies there. Uh, I did add a bit of code into that to kind of help uh, discern or like skew the results a bit because it, it, it's completely reliant on um, one for the Macy scan results. It relies on uh, whatever type of severity you set in Macy. You can set it in Datacop. But to follow up with your question, all of that that you just said can be configured in Macy within itself. So you can go into the console and make up your own little rules and change it a little bit to um, escalate or de-escalate or declassify certain things, if that makes sense. Yeah. Any other questions? Oh, yeah. How many commands to have Datacop be less reliant on Macy in maybe some future iteration, or will it always be a supplement to be much more reliant on Datacop? Uh, I would say uh, the only reason why I'm relying on it, one, well, it was a side project, and two, um, it's much easier to scale, and it's m more supported with other AWS services, so it makes it a bit easier to leverage Macy. But you, I have um, plans to kind of add uh, what I call th third-party extensions to it to allow people to kind of like, you know, leverage other things or other resources. But right now, it's definitely Macy just because it's AWS and it's easily supported. Yeah, no worries. Any other questions? If not, you guys can pull me to the side and talk if you don't want to ask anything <laughs> else. <laughs> All right. Sweet. Thank you. No problem. Thank you. Hey, uh, now we're all seven steps closer to becoming cloud security architects. So thank you, Damien. No all right, I've got the uh, the next talks. Uh, we have had a bit of a change. Let me go ahead and share what's going on with y'all. Track one over there, uh, right in about uh, at 3.30, we've got Peter Liu with the journey of security automation. Uh, after that, we have Jason Kohler with visual badge forgery at 4.30. Here, uh, the next talk's at 3.30.